Love and Light. This is Healthy Talk Show for Monday, September 30th, 2019. I'm Robert. And I'm Marissa. HealthyTalkShow.com slash support if you want to help financially produce the show. Our show is value for value. So if you find value in our contents, please provide some back. HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. Show notes for this episode with the links of everything we talk about are located over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash 22. On this episode of Healthy Talk Show, we have people eating bugs, some vaginal science, and a world leader that has a beef with big tech companies. But first, Ars Technica, NASA wants to send nuclear rockets to the moon. Oops. NASA. Sorry, Ars Technica reporting a nuclear rocket engine would be twice as efficient as their chemical engines powering rockets today, but despite their conceptual simplicity, Small-scale fission reactors are challenging to build and risky to operate because they produce toxic waste. Space travel is dangerous enough without having to worry about nuclear meltdown. But for future human missions to the moon and Mars, NASA believes such risks may be necessary. We have a video over here from What the Future called NASA's Nuclear Rocket Program is Making a Comeback. NASA has been flirting with the idea of nuclear-powered spaceflight since the 1940s because it offers some significant advantages over traditional rocket propulsion. Here's how it works. Energy from nuclear fission heats hydrogen molecules which are accelerated through a nozzle creating propulsion. A nuclear reaction releases about 10 million times the energy of a chemical reaction, and the chemical reaction that powers today's rockets requires a lot of heavy fuel. That heavy fuel means that in order to reach distant targets like Jupiter or Saturn, NASA needs to rely on a gravity assist. Also known as the slingshot effect, this energy saving maneuver nearly doubles the travel time between worlds, also doubling the hypothetical space traveler's exposure to space radiation. Nuclear thermal propulsion could make this slingshot effect a thing of the past, but this technology also poses some unique risks. And the risks that we cut out because the video would be long have everything to do with nuclear. Like, you yeah. Know, the usual fear mongering. Radiation, waste, Chernobyl. all that good stuff, which is what, what it is, but that's fine. Moving on. Next part. Congress recently set aside $125 million to revitalize the development of nuclear thermal rockets. NASA hadn't asked for any money for that purpose. But with leaders in business and politics talking about Mars colonies, lunar gateways, and space force, it's not much of a surprise NASA is being asked to dust off this old idea once again. There it is. Yeah, this is great, though. Yeah. Because nuclear technologies, they're getting safer all the time. So I don't see where else, you know, what other choice they have, especially energy density-wise. Yeah, even for green energy, nuclear is the way to go. Yeah, that's I see a true. lot of windmills popping up still. I don't understand that. In other NASA news, NASA opens call for Artemis lunar landers. NASA is seeking proposals for human lunar landing systems designed and developed by American companies for the Artemis program, which includes sending the first woman and the next man to the surface of the moon by 2024. The final call to the industry comes after NASA issued two drafts on July 19th and August 30th, encouraging companies to send comments to help shape a key component of the agency's human exploration Artemis partnerships. NASA is expected to make multiple awards to industry to develop and demonstrate a human landing system, the first company to comp- Complete its lander will carry astronauts to the surface in 2024, and carry second company will land in 2025. Proposals to build landing systems are due November 1st, in an ambitious timeline. I, yeah. Yeah. Sounds like it. Sounds like an ambitious timeline from NASA. Yeah. That just popped up today. Good get old your NASA. proposals in quick. Yeah, get them in quick. That's <laughs> that is a, that's very quick. You know, to, I used to work in government, and 30 days to build a shed was ambitious so yeah good luck i <laughs> don't know how that, don't know how that works yeah uh, yeah all right ex google ex facebook tech lead that's what he calls himself made a video called are facebook employees depressed h1b salary visa and abuse we have reinstitutionalized slavery and this is largely through the h1b visa process the way it should work is you bring in high-skilled labor from overseas that you cannot access within the United States. Once you bring them in, you're supposed to treat them well, respect them, because they're so hard to get. However, most Silicon Valley tech companies have found loopholes to bring in cheap labor that they can use and abuse. Once these workers are brought in, they're entirely under your control. And if they underperform for any reason, you can just fire them. 
and they will face deportation. So for the worker, their choice is they either do exactly as you say, or they can be deported. Their entire livelihood could be messed up. This is a pretty timely topic, the H-1B. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of controversy with the H-1B program. Yeah. Well, let, let's keep diving into the video. All right, well, the next video technically describes why he left Groupon. But back when I was working at Groupon, the real reason that I quit was because it was one of these wage slave factory farms. They have an office over in Palo Alto, but as soon as I entered, I noticed that everybody there was either Indian or Chinese. That's where most of these H-1B visa workers are coming from, and the manager showed absolutely no respect. I remember one of my coworkers kept asking our manager to file some visa application paperwork, and the manager kept delaying and delaying and missed the deadline. Intentionally, I believe. And so this is really all about control. Yeah. That's... In, the, in this next video, it's what has the big innovation in tech been over the past decade? I think we'd all be, we're all going to be surprised. <laughs> a lot of Silicon Valley tech companies, they're using a tactic of hire and fire, slash and burn, rinse and repeat, churning through thousands of slaves. So the big innovation in tech over the past decade has not been React.js, some JavaScript framework or API. It's been the reintroduction of modernized slavery. And you know, this is a lose-lose situation because American jobs are being displaced. High-skilled workers from overseas are not able to get in on the visas and get the respect that they deserve. And then anybody who's able to get in on an H-1B, skilled or not, is treated like garbage. See, there's no talent shortage. Tech companies have just invented some BS interview game as a way to filter out American candidates and give priority to cheap labor from overseas that they can have absolute control over. Very disturbing. Yep. And his last clip is on diversity in tech companies. It's funny that tech companies are always complaining about diversity. There's not enough women in tech, not enough black people in tech. You know, the fact is there's plenty of diversity out there. The problem is that they're not immigrants who you can control and underpay. <laughs> what? Damn. What's sad is we see the same issues in academia, especially yes. for postdocs. Mm -hmm. And you have set salaries and you can easily get a bunch of, you know, visas and immigrant people to work yeah. in your lab because of exactly what he said. And the, they'll work three times the hours precisely. or be and, deported. And in a postdoc where you can essentially work a ridiculous 80 number of hours a week every day, that, that they exploit them. <laughs> and, and they have this false STEM shortage as well, which he kind of mentions. I've heard of a lot of students in STEM who have issues finding jobs, and I think Americans are losing out to a lot of these H-1B people. And yeah. we aren't talking about it. Enough. No, no one's talking about it. Well, no one's talking about what's going on at the UC system either. I know a few people are. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just look up H-1B UC system. I don't want to talk about it right now. <laughs> HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. It's another podcast. All right. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. Amazon announced 15 new products last Wednesday, September 25th, including Echo Buds, Echo Loop, Alexa Smart Oven, and Echo Frames. What the hell are Echo Frames? I don't know. Let's find out. I have an announcement video. They look just like regular prescription glasses. In fact, the fact that I'm still talking to you says they are prescription glasses. They have my lenses in them. And they're incredibly comfortable. They are only 31 grams. You barely know that you have them. And we've intentionally not put a display in them. We've not put a camera in them. We want you to focus on your everyday. And Alexa should be here to augment that through the day. And it turns out that as you're driving to work. Alexa should be here to augment yeah. my everyday. How, how are, what is she going to offer yeah. to my day? Yeah. <laughs> Walking through the uh, walking through Seattle, it's a delightful way to get to the Alexa experience. And built into this is very discreet directional microphones that allow me to hear the no hear what's going on, but not the world around me. Wait, allows who to hear what and not the world? What? What? My microphones? Did, what? what? <laughs> okay, they do it. Let's hear that again one more time. And built into this is very discreet directional microphones that allow me to hear the no me to hear hear what's going on but not the world around me so wait me <laughs> as the user i get to hear what i don't understand whatever i'm confused yeah that was uh, uh that's a weird one a weird slip that's a weird one i don't i don't understand what's going on <laughs> but 
Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Boris Johnson, gave a speech where he talked about privacy and technology companies, among other things. But this is the good part of the speech. Let's take a watch. It's, uh, it's customary for the British Prime Minister to come to this United Nations and pledge to advance our values and defend our rules, uh, the rules of a peaceful world, uh, protecting freedom of navigation in the Gulf, to persevering in the vital task of achieving a two-state solution in the conflict in the Middle East. And of course, I'm proud to do all these things. But no one can ignore a gathering force that is reshaping the future of every member of this assembly. There has been nothing like it in history. When I think of the great scientific revolutions of the past, print, the steam engine, aviation, the atomic age, I think of new tools that we acquired, but over which we, the human race, had the advantage, which we controlled. And that is not necessarily the case in the digital age. You may keep your secrets from your friends, from your parents, your children, your doctor, even your personal trainer. But it takes real effort to conceal your thoughts from Google. And if that is true today, in future, there may be nowhere to hide. Whoa. <laughs> I said Google. I would also like to add Amazon to that. Yeah. <laughs> or or anyone that has large amounts of data, face bag. Face bag. But they don't have so many listening devices. That's I think true. the culprits would be Apple, Google, and Amazon for the listening yeah. devices. But yeah, Facebook does have a large amount of data. But yeah. Carrying on with Mr. Boris Johnson. Smart cities will pollulate with sensors all joined together by the Internet of Things. Bollards communing invisibly with lampposts, so there is always a parking space for your electric car, so that no bin goes unemptied, no street unswept, and the urban environment is as antiseptic as a Zurich pharmacy. But this technology could also be used to keep every citizen under round-the-clock surveillance. A future Alexa will pretend to take orders, but this Alexa will be watching you, clucking her tongue and stamping her foot. In future, voice connecti connectivity will be in every room and almost every object. Your, your mattress will monitor your nightmares. Your fridge will beep for more cheese. Your front door will sweep wide the moment you approach like some silent butler. Your smart meter will go hustling of its own accord for the cheapest electricity and every one of them minutely transcribing your every habit in tiny electronic shorthand stored, not in their chips or in their innards, nowhere you can find it, but in some great cloud of data that lowers ever more oppressively over the human race. Damn. Yeah. But the fact that a leader said that... <laughs> Yep. Really? We got, we got more. We got oh, a few minutes. <laughs> All right. Sorry. A giant dark thundercloud waiting to burst. And we have no control over how or when the precipitation will take place. And every day that we tap on our phones or work on our iPads, as I see some of you are doing now, we not only leave our indelible spur in the ether, but we are ourselves becoming a resource, click by click, tap by tap. Just as the Carboniferous period created the indescribable wealth, leaf by decaying leaf, of hydrocarbons, data is the crude oil of the modern economy. And we're now in an environment where we don't know who should own these new oil fields. We don't know who should have the rights or the title to these gushers of cash. And we don't know who decides how to use that data. And can these algorithms be trusted with our lives and hopes? Should the machines, and only the machines, decide whether or not we are eligible for a mortgage or insurance, or what surgery or medicines we should receive? Wow. Interesting, yeah. though. Who owns the data? What? Yeah. You know, Steam went down this weekend, and we couldn't play Grand Theft Auto, the game that we own, because Steam was down, it has to connect to the cloud. And yeah. 
just talk about on a small scale, trying to simplify things a little bit, being a little more lighthearted. Yeah. This is kind of that's true. One more clip, two minutes. We're good to go. One more time. Are we doomed to a cold and heartless future in which computer says yes or computer says no with the grim finality of an emperor in the arena? How do you plead with an algorithm? How do you get it to see extenuating circumstances? And how do we know that the machines have not been insidiously programmed to fool us or even to cheat us? We're already uh, using all kinds of messaging services that offer instant communication at minimal cost. And these same programs, platforms, could also be designed for real-time censorship of every conversation with offending words automatically deleted Indeed. Facebook Messenger, probably. Yeah, or any messenger. Or any messenger that's not... That's not encrypted. Encrypted end to end. <laughs> In some countries, this happens today. Digital authoritarianism is not, alas, the stuff of dystopian fantasy, but of an emerging reality. And the reason I'm giving this speech today with this slightly gloomy proem pro is that the UK is one of the world's tech leaders, and I believe governments have been simply caught unawares by the unintended consequences of the internet, a scientific breakthrough far more reaching in its everyday psychological impact than any other invention since Gutenberg. And when you consider how long it took for books to come into widespread circulation, the arrival of the internet is far bigger than print, it's bigger than the atomic age, but it's like nuclear power in that it's capable of both good and harm, and of course it's not alone. As new technologies seem to race towards us from the far horizon, we strain our eyes as they come to make out whether they are for good or bad, friends or foes. AI. Damn. <laughs> I like what he said that it's, what, the most psychologically impactful invention? Oh, yes. That was... Yes, the social medias. And, yeah. Yeah. It's, and it really is shaping people. It it is, and we're addicted to it, and we we are not fully understanding its consequences. No, and children are being exposed to it too early. Yeah, but the privacy thing is it's a big deal. It's, yeah, and and people do not understand the value of their data. Yes, and that's and the problem is they'll probably understand when it's too late. Yes, and remember. It's not about you having something to hide. It's about people in power having something to hide and then data being able to use it against them. And then you don't want the you don't want a private company to be able to influence a politician and, you know, blackmail them with their data. Yeah. Plus what he said about the algos is another disturbing topic. I don't want to <clears throat> excuse me, delve into it too much today, but I know a few studies are kind of showing that these algos and credit scores are a part of that. Mm -hmm that they are exacerbating these differences, the socioeconomic differences. So, you know, again, if you're poor. And <laughs> credit karma, talking about credit scores and all that, who who invested a lot of money in credit karma? Was it Alphabet? I believe And Alphabet's so. a subsidiary of Google, a company that has a lot of money. They invested, what, 80 million or something like that? Which yeah, was 85 million. Out with, of 116 or something 118, total, 118, yeah. So million. they're, they're so the majority shareholder. So these yeah. companies, they're... And, and China already has a social credit score. And they we, do. We it's, talked about that previously. Yes, and we're going to try to find out more information. It's just a little hard to get information out of China because of the laws yeah there. censorship exactly what he was saying censorship. but <laughs> yeah. you have censorship <laughs> and speaking of privacy and technology companies and spying here's a clip from democracy now of american whistleblower edward snowden talking about a about privacy again and this uh this is what drove me forward eventually i realized the u.s government had stopped caring about what they should do uh, and instead we're pursuing uh as aggressively as possible what they could do and this meant every time you made a phone call, the NSA literally got a copy of it delivered to them the next day, a record of that call, not what you said on it, but that you made it, who you made it to, when it happened, where you were, when it was made. Um, they were tracking the locations of people around the world. Just, uh, it happened across the wire and they happened to see it because they were creating a collection platforms that meant anything that passed by their systems was as they called ingested right it was brought into our databases and then all you had to do 
think about it. You have every text message, you have every email, you have every web request. Uh, you know where every cell phone in the world is because you have access to um, the records of where they're located because every cell phone, in order to function on the network, has to be paired with these cell phone towers, right? When you look at your, your signal bars, what is that saying? That's just saying how far you are from the nearest cell phone tower. Uh, and all of those towers are saying, oh, I see this person at this time. They've got this phone number. We know their billing address. They live at this location. Uh, and when you take all of this in aggregate, what we were building and what we were trying to store uh, to a greater and greater distance uh, every year was history's first permanent record of everyone's life. Oh, my gosh. That's... Just by storing all the data. Yeah. Store all the data. Permanent record. And I mean, we really need to start looking at what our government knows. And we really need to start using encryption, too. Yeah. A lot of people hold Edward Snowden in high regard for what he did and consider him to be an expert in privacy. Here's another clip from him from Pod Save America. But first, what messaging application does Edward Snowden recommend? Does anyone know? Anyone at home know? Let's see. Let's see. Got a clip. What do you use or, or what would you tell activists and organizers to use for secure communications? Uh, so there are a lot of uh, different guides that talk about what to do, particularly if you're involved in activism or security or concerned about these kind of things. If you go to protests, uh, right, you need to be thinking about this. You can search for uh, articles uh, just by writing, you know, Edward Snowden and uh, privacy tips. But broadly, immediately, like if you're listening to this right now and you have an iPhone uh, or you're on uh, Android, you can just go to the App Store and you can type in Signal Messenger, right? Uh, this is considered the gold standard right now for security. Uh, you can send any kind of file back and forth, whether it's a PDF, uh, you know, whether it's a, a video, whether it's a picture. Uh, you don't need to know all these different identifiers as long as you just got somebody's phone number. There you go. Signal. It's what Signal. we use. Don't it's use Snapchat. Don't use Snapchat. That's not secure. Yeah. They see your nudies. Sorry. Don't use Snapchat. <laughs> All right. An article from the New York Times. How to develop an appetite for insects. Quoting from the article, some thinks it's future of food. In 2013, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations released a report declaring the need to swap traditional protein sources for insects to support a sustainable future. The report helped drive an explosion of efforts all dedicated to making millworms your next meal. Presenters at a 2018 conference in Georgia eating insects Athens published papers this month in a special issue of Annals of en how you say that? Entomological. Entomological Society of America. The volume showed how people who study insects scientifically are now spending more time thinking about eating them. The article mentions, in, how do you say that word? Inter and entomophagy entomophagy which, which is eating bugs the article also links to amazon where it's a lot of cricket bar protein See, mixes and the, stuff the fact that it links to amazon makes me even more convinced this is just a marketing stunt oh yeah that's true because <laughs> my my one problem with this is how overpriced it is it's expensive are we going to look at how expensive it is yeah let's look at the cost all right 275 per yeah per bar holy crap yeah these things are expensive i've seen them at the airport but wow that's crazy here are a few clips from a tedx with alex drysdale founder of crick nutrition which is a cricket protein company so he's far from unbiased but entertaining yeah. <laughs> every single person in this room and watching this video has eaten bugs they're in everything we eat the FDA and other agencies around the world allow bugs in our food because they're impossible to keep out. And in fact, many of them are actually good for you, but I'm getting ahead of myself. For example, just one cup of rice can contain wait, up to wait. three. Look at that giant. <laughs> he puts giant bugs in there, dude. Oh, yeah. The way he's it's, visual, like, come yeah. on. Well, yeah, it's true. It's a little exaggerated, very exaggerated. Three whole insects. The tomato sauce used on one regular sized pizza can have up to 30 fly eggs or two whole maggots. Emphasis on the word can. Yeah. <laughs> what about the dough for that same pizza? Well, 
there can be up to 1,900 visible insect fragments in there. And one more for those of us on a low-carb diet. <laughs> the ground coffee used to make one standard cup can contain up to 60 bug parts. So he's basically saying you should eat bugs because you're already eating them. Yeah, I'm not sure I'm quite convinced I'm of that. I'm fairly one. certain because <laughs> if you go to his cricket protein company, cricket nutrition, crick nutrition, I think I... Did I? I didn't. Never mind. I didn't pull it up. My bad. It, he links to his TEDx video, but I actually like his reasons for eating crickets because this is what the reasons people always list. I edited a bunch a little bit, so you'll just see three main reasons why eating bugs are a good idea. First, they're one of the most nutritionally dense foods on the entire planet. I'm using crickets as the example because they're considered the gateway bug. They have over double the protein versus beef, more calcium than milk, and more omegas and B12 vitamins than wild salmon. Second point, and this is the one that really drove it home for me and is also a major factor as to why they're, grown, they're, why they're farmed around the world. It's because they're really easy to grow. They require much less resources than traditional livestock, making them a much more sustainable option. Third reason we should be eating bugs is it's more ethical. If you think of cows, pigs, chickens, we've all seen pictures of them unnaturally crammed into pens. Unfortunately, this is the only way to farm them efficiently at scale. Crickets, on the other hand, they cluster together all on their own, and we end up giving them way more space than they actually even want. And when it's time to collect the crickets, dry ice is introduced into their bins, and being cold-blooded, the temperature drop puts them into a state of hibernation before they're harvested. It's they're the same arguments that are always made yeah. for eating crickets, so I felt it's good to put in the show, but... I'm not going to be eating them any, unless you want to send us some crickets, please. Yeah. I will definitely eat I, some crickets. HealthyTalkShow.com slash support, please. My other issue with this is they start the industrial scale farming of this, and then it requires a lot of energy to yeah, produce. Yeah, right now it's small scale. Oh, yeah, yeah. growing them in shoeboxes. So I always wonder, well, how truly energy efficient is it, especially compared to just eating a lot of plants with a little bit of meat? Or Yep. But, yeah. Yep. Newsweek and Ars Technica both ran pieces about vaginal fluid transplants or VFTs from the Ars article. Vaginal fluid transplants could revolutionize the way we view and treat conditions affecting the female reproductive tract. Researchers at Johns Hopkins wrote in a recent study on vaginal microbiota transplants, VMTs, if they are to work as researchers hypothesize, they could rub out many common problems at once. And based on what we know of vaginas, they could be far less messy than transplants involving poop. Comparing the poop transplant to... So, well... What do you think? I think it's really interesting. Yeah? So there, part of this research comes from studying women who have sex with women, mm -hmm. and they found that they have very good vaginal health, and that could be one way to transfer bacteria back and forth. So that was one study, and now this study looked at uh, maybe trying to find different people that could act as donors and could serve as a good vaginal culture and this is really important especially for you ladies out there i can talk as a woman it's very hard to treat some of these conditions because uh bacterial vaginosis that's an overgrowth of bad bacteria and only humans have this kind of relationship with bacteria so it's hard to study in any other system so it has to be studied in females okay. right, of humans so we can't even study primates and we also have the issue is when we try to treat these infections with medication, that doesn't actually restore your microbiota. And we can think about this uh, if you drink kefir or other probiotics. That's kind of the same thing. You're trying to restore the natural bacteria of your body. And that's the same idea with this vaginal bacteria transplant. That's awesome. Yeah. We and drink kefir. <laughs> We do. So would this be able to help celiac, theoretically? <laughs> well, actually, in some ways, you know, celiac leads to other deficiencies, and you could have an imbalance of the yeast and, and bacteria, which is important in your whole body, but mm -hmm. especially in the vagina. So, yeah. And okay. it's a lot easier to do because women can essentially do it themselves yeah. as opposed to uh, 
poop where that's a lot harder to do don't do that at yeah that's we've we've <laughs> joked about it because you have celiac we've yeah. up, and i have great gut bacteria i, I great, know i can eat anything i don't get sick ever i don't yeah. react to food at all my gut is just iron we've ta- joked about doing a poop transplant but yeah i can't help you with this one unfortunately <laughs> not equipped no. it's it's very interesting very interesting research we support it yeah we're good to go believe so all righty Please consider helping us produce Healthy Talk Show by he- heading over to healthytalkshow.com slash support. Your financial contribution will ensure we remain unbiased commercial fee and will help us pay for things like rent and the electricity to just heat our place. Remember, we just moved to a very cold place now. <laughs> our show is also value for value. Another way to provide value is feedback or email is ask at healthytalkshow.com. Call us at 509-878-3229 and HealthyTalkShow.com slash social for all of our social media links. We record Healthy Talk Show live on Mondays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. That's 3 a.m. UTC. Come join the fun at HealthyTalkShow.com slash live. Love and light. Love and light.